Hello, glad you could join us. I'm Danielle Walker, senior reporter at SC Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast entitled The Insiders, A Rogues Gallery. This session is sponsored by Spectrosoft. Our speaker today is Mike Tierney. He's the COO at Spectrosoft, and he'll discuss how organizations can better identify insider threats and properly, properly monitor these scenarios to prevent them from escalating. During this webcast, I'll also explain the six types of insiders and their different motivations. Welcome, Mike. How are you? I'll let you start things off. Great, Danielle. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone uh, who's joined us. I see quite a few people online, and I appreciate you making some time on your Friday to, uh, to, to spend with us, and I hope we're going to, the time that we spend together here will be a uh, time you consider well spent. Uh, when we're done, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speaking to you from South Florida, but today's not sunny South Florida, so um, I'm, I'm suffering a little bit with the folks that were uh, dealing with the, the winter weather. We don't have any sun today, and, you know, it, recently it's been as cold as like 40, so uh, we feel your pain. Um, we did a survey, Spectrosoft did, uh, back in the fourth quarter of 2014 uh, in conjunction with a, a very respected resource organization, um, and we asked them to go out and, and look at some different things about the user activity, employee monitoring markets, and specifically uh, to, to ask some questions and to look at some things related to insider threat. And uh, we got back some very interesting data, and I thought I'd start there today. Um, for those of you that are interested in the background on the survey, we had uh, about 350 respondents spread across verticals, uh, retail, financial services, professional services, public sector, and healthcare. Um, all the companies had more than 1,000 employees, and they were spread throughout North America, EMEA, and Asia Pacific. And uh, one of the things that came through in the survey that there are three main threat vectors that, that folks are worried about when it pertains to the insider threat. The first is an external threat, kind of the classic uh, account takeover. So this is a, an instance where an outside actor is effectively becoming an insider because they've gotten a hold of compromised credentials. Um, and we're going to spend some time talking about that today. Uh, we're also going to spend some time talking about the malicious insider. Uh, and this is, uh, you'll see this frequently referred to as disgruntled employees. There are, there are more types of malicious insiders that we will go through today. Um, but these are people that are legitimate employees or contractors. They're supposed to be inside your network, but they are seeking to intentionally do some harm. And then the third uh, threat vector was the non-malicious insider. And again, these are legitimate people. They belong inside the, inside the network, inside the perimeter. Um, and there's an absence of, uh, of evil intent here, if you will. Um, but these are folks maybe through negligence or uh, ignorance or just, you know, simple accident um, caused damage to the company. And we're, we're not going to spend any of our time focusing on the non-malicious insider today, um, but we are going to spend some time focusing on both the malicious insider and on that that external actor who becomes an insider, and that's where we're going to start today. So we're going to meet the, the first member of, of our rogues gallery, the imposter. So as we said, the imposter is an external actor who's gained insider credentials. Um, this is one of the most common forms of attack, um, very, very common way for, for outsiders to get in and then be able to navigate around the network. These can be pure outsiders, someone who has no business being in your network and never did, um, or they can be ex-insiders. And, and there's a, a little bit of a debate, I guess, on whether you classify an ex-employee or an ex-contractor who still has credentials um, as an insider or an outsider, and you'll see some of that in a few slides. Um, again, these folks are typically going to target privileged credentials. These credentials could be uh, person accounts. They could be service accounts. Um, you know, shared accounts or accounts tied to, uh, to a single person. But as I said earlier, this is one of the most common forms of external attack. You know, I, I saw uh, an incident with an ex-insider uh, once uh, personally some years ago during a demonstration. This is in another company, but I thought I'd relate it. We're actually demonstrating some software uh, for a company in California. And as we were doing that, it looked at Active Directory, um, we actually saw activity occurring from an account of an employee who had been terminated. Um, and it was happening live while we were watching it. So, you know, needless to say, the demo came to a very quick halt because the, the people in the room uh, from the company that had that activity going on decided they had a higher priority at that moment, which we understood. Um, but it was interesting to, to be able to see something like that 
get uncovered uh, live uh, as it was happening. So what can we do about the imposter, about the, the outsider become insider on our network? There's a lot of common sense things. Um, some of them, I'm sure, are being done by many of you today. Um, some of them, maybe we can come up with some new ideas here together. Um, certainly enforcing lease privilege uh, is going to go a long way towards helping you make sure that it's not that easy to leapfrog from one place to another should they compromise a set of credentials. Um, a good PAM solution, a privileged account management solution, can really help you here as well. Um, that doesn't count as a sales pitch for those of you keeping score at home because I don't sell a PAM solution. Um, but I think that those are very powerful tools that can help you in a number of ways, but with this particular use case as well. Um, you also want to monitor privileged account usage and, and look for anomalies and look for anomalous behavior. And we're going to talk about that a couple of different times. Um, you know, certainly as well uh, with logging all access attempts, you want to um, you know, look for things that are out of the ordinary in terms of access as well. And when it's related to privileged users, because of the elevation of privileges that they have, the damage that they can do is elevated as well. So you want to be looking for those types of things. And then I'd also encourage you to watch your traffic. Um, and this may be something that, that folks are doing, and it may be something that not everyone is doing. But there are, there are kind of three ways um, that an imposter can be caught on a network. Um, that, that come immediately to mind for me. The, the first is during this sort of initial phase of malicious activity, um, when they're scanning, when they're inside, and they're, and they're um, looking to propagate an attack, there's going to be some obvious signs potentially. You, you could see things like password cracking, very straightforward, easy to pick up on a wire. It's, it's a loud, noisy behavior. A very good, talented imposter should not resort to these type of techniques, um, but it happens a lot, and the majority of of the type of external attacks coming in, you're going to see behaviors like this. And they're surprisingly successful because of things like weak passwords, uh, default credentials that have never been changed, and, uh, and things like poor firewall policy. Um, the second area where you can catch an imposter in on the network is going to be when they're in their data gathering phase. And a, and a true insider and an outsider become insider or an imposter uh, are going to show very similar behaviors. Um, there, there's, a, there's an amount of information that a person can use in a, in a regular uh, work day. Um, if you're in the healthcare industry, there's a, there's a typical amount of medical records that a doctor or a nurse could access in a given day. Uh, in the insurance industry, a, an insurance adjuster can only work on so many cases in a day. So if you look at the volume of information that people are accessing, you, you want to look for spikes in that. If you see something jump to a number that just simply doesn't make sense anymore based on what the norm is, you know, that's, that's an indication that you may have the potential for data exfiltration event happening. Now, this data is going to appear to be going to an internal and friendly system um, because these, person have got, these people have got on the inside. Um, so you know, the last phase that you want to start looking for um, is the actual data exfiltration. Once that, that imposter has data within, within their grasp, then they have option, options for getting it off the network. They don't have as many options, however, as a true insider. Um, you know, they certainly can't carry a laptop out or, or push something off to a USB stick or print the data. They have to get that data out of, off your network to a remote server. Um, we saw this in the target data exfiltration to a temporarily provisioned cloud account. That's a very common way that things are, are happening. So you want to start looking for any streams or any big streams in particular um, that are not part of your network baseline. So again, we're going to start looking for anomalies. And I just make another quick comment here that this is an area where uh, DLP solutions have a propensity to break down. Um, if, the, if the imposter is smart enough to know that they want to encrypt the data that they're pushing out and do that in an encrypted stream, your DLP solution is not going to, not going to do a too good a job normally of seeing that. So you're really going to want to be looking at your network traffic from a security perspective. There's a lot of tools out there that can help you look at network traffic for performance reasons. Um, there are some great tools out there that help you do it um, for purely security purposes. Uh, there's a company, FlowTrack, um, that I know some of the folks over at that are doing a great job. I'd encourage you guys to check them out. And again, I'm not letting you count that as a product pitch because that's not my product. Um, so that's a little bit today about the, uh, the imposter, the, the external actor become insider. So let's step forward a little bit. And, and just as a quick recap on the types of insider threats, we've looked at the, the external actor, 
We've decided we're not going to talk about the non-malicious insider. So for the rest of our time here today, we're going to focus on the malicious insider. Um, there are five members remaining in our rogues gallery, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to take a look at each one of those. Now, before we dive into them, I thought it would be helpful to just quickly you know, set a common baseline for us on, on what a malicious insider is. And uh, the, the, the good folks over at Carnegie Mellon, they do a fantastic job in this area, um, have what I think is the de facto definition for a malicious insider threat. And we're talking about um, someone who has been given authorized access and is now using that in a way that they should not be doing it. You know, and I referenced earlier where I talked about whether an ex-employer, an ex-contractor um, should be classified as an insider or an external actor. You know, in the classic definition here, um, the guys at CERT certainly classify them as an insider, and I can certainly understand that logic. Um, you know, good uh, commentary here from the FBI uh, about the dangers of the insider threat. The person inside the network um, is harder to detect, or frequently harder to detect, and they certainly have the ability to cause the most damage. They have legitimate access, and they know where the things that they're looking for are. So I thought that would be a good uh, baseline for us as we move forward and look at the five remaining, uh, five remaining types of insider threat that we're going to talk to today. And we're going to start with the second member of our rogues gallery, Entitled Eddie. And I, you know, I noticed as I was looking through the slides earlier today that, that Entitled Eddie looks a lot like Michael Keaton, so I hope he's not upset with us. Um, I don't think that's actually him, but... so. So who is Entitled Eddie? This is an employee with a, a, a defined sense of entitlement. In the lower right-hand corner of the slide there, we have the dictionary definition for entitlement, and it's, it's, the, con it's the condition of believing you have a right to something. Um, and, and we see this very commonly, um, especially in areas where there's creativity being done and in a couple other areas where people believe that their work product belongs to them as much, if not more, than it does to the company or the organization that's employing them. Um, I used to be in sales. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You see this type of thing very commonly in sales. There's a lot of sweat equity that goes into, into selling. It's a lot of hard work um, building up contacts, building accounts, uh, account profiles, um, helping to create a territory. Um, you're going to have a lot of very valuable information that can help you sell. Um, if you're doing a good job, you're going to have information about about your customers or prospects, family, birthdays, um, where they like to go on vacation, what kind of dog they have. Um, you're certainly going to have a lot of information about the company that they work for. And a lot of times salespeople believe that that is their work. Um, that data belongs to them, and they're entitled to bring it with them should they leave and go somewhere else, up to and including a competitor. Um, you know, I, I've seen... Uh, you know, things, you know, fairly recently where there, there are salespeople who to this day resist putting data into CRM systems because they believe the company is actually not entitled to it. It belongs to them. And if you think culturally about salespeople, um, you know, that's an area where we tell, where we, we, we typically will tell salespeople, be selfish. Um, be focused on your goal and your success because if you have a lot of people in individual production hitting their individual numbers, it makes the company successful. So it's, a, it's somewhat of a, an understandable sense of entitlement. Um, you see it again with coders, with, with people that are, that are writing code. Again, there's a lot of sweat equity in that. They've, they're creating something from nothing. They're making something work. They're very proud of their work, and they should be very proud of their work. Um, I've seen... Um, you know, this entitled behavior, I've seen it in marketing. I've seen uh, ads that ran at company A and, and did very well show up at company B years later, and it was very easy to see um, that an employee had moved from company A to company B, and they had taken some of their creative with them. Um, now, insider risk becomes threat for these entitled folks when it's time for them to move on. Um, when, they, when they've decided they're going to leave a company or they're leaving the company not of their own choice, um, that's when they're going to be seeking to take work product with them. Um, this can happen when employees are disillusioned or disgruntled, as that, that sort of classic definition from the beginning mentions. Um, but they don't have to be particularly unhappy. Sometimes the grass just appears greener somewhere else. Sometimes they're being recruited. <clears throat> so the question is, what can we do? And how can we help protect the company against someone with a sense of entitlement? Well, a few ideas to talk through. Um, 
One, you know, at the very beginning of an employee life cycle, discuss ownership of work product up front. Do it clearly. Um, make sure that your IP and confidentiality agreements, whatever those documents are that you're asking employees to sign, um, that spell out their responsibilities in terms of company information and ownership of work products are clear. Uh, I encourage you guys to work with your, your legal departments uh, if you can and ask them to avoid legalese in this area wherever possible. You know, a lot of times when you're, when you're drafting agreements for people that don't work with legal documents on a regular basis, you need to use plain language. I worked with an attorney for a number of years but when there was something we wanted to make sure there was absolutely no gray about, would insert the phrase for the avoidance of doubt. He usually followed that with a colon. And then in very plain English, sometimes in the form of an example, would spell out exactly what we were talking about. And I think that's a, a really valuable thing that can be done um, because otherwise sometimes those agreements can just be so legal-focused um, that people have a hard time even wrapping their hands around them where they see gray where gray does not exist. You want to reinforce um, what you established up front when appropriate. So you certainly want to do that when someone is leaving an organization, um, but there's other times. You could have uh, on a change of job responsibilities. Uh, something that I've seen in my career several times is uh, a person in development or engineering make a transition to product management. Um, when you think about something like that, they're certainly still working with the product. Um, they're helping to shape its future. But there's no reason for them to have access to code, whether they wrote it in the past or not. Um, so it, that would be an appropriate time to sit down with an individual in a situation like that where they're transitioning responsibilities and talk about how access to certain things is no longer to be in their purview. And if they have any of it um, on another machine or down on a personal machine, that they would want to make sure that they destroy it. Um, and that's another thing that you see sometimes in those IP agreements is they'll say return confidential information. I would go back and suggest you make sure that it includes the word destroy because it's very hard to return bits. Um, and then the last piece that, that I would uh, advise you to do is review the online activity of employees that are leaving the company. Um, and in the case of, of the entitled insider or entitled Eddie here, we're looking for data collection and we're looking for data exfiltration activity. Um, the experts at CERT have shown us, um, we've seen it across our customer base, that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of theft, IP theft and data theft, occurs in the 30-day period just prior to someone giving notice of their resignation. Um, so that's an event that occurs that is telling you something bad for your company may have happened in the 30 days before it. So as an organization, you've got to have the ability to react very quickly and you have to have the ability to roll back the calendar very quickly so that you can do a pretty comprehensive review of the activity that's taken place um, for that particular insider. The statistics are, are mind-boggling on how many people think it is okay to take information with them. Uh, one out of two is a safe number uh, for you to use as a, as a plug. Um, I've seen numbers vary from 48% to 51%. Um, so if you have a couple of people leaving your company, the chances are one of them is taking something with them that they really shouldn't. And when you start to think about all the different ways that an, that an insider can take data off the network, they could be sending it out through email, they could be uploading it to a bring-your-own-cloud solution like a Dropbox or a box, they can be printing it, they can be using removable media, um, you can all, you're also going to see things even before that activity occurs um, with potentially unusual download activity as they collect the data that they then want to take with them. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to be reviewed. So I, I want to strongly encourage everyone to make sure they have a policy in place where you review the online activity of departing employees um, in that 30-day window, and that's going to hold whether they are resigning and they've given you notice or whether the company is asking them to leave. Because frequently people see that coming, and, and that 30-day window opens up when they believe their time, their, the employee life cycle for them may be coming to an end. So that's a little bit about Entitled Eddie. Um, we're going to keep moving through our, our rogues gallery, if you will, of insiders. And the next one we're going to take a look at is the ringleader. Um, and the ringleader is a little bit different, um, although a lot of the same things that we've talked about are going to apply when we talk about uh, ways to help deal with a ringleader. Um, the sense of entitlement is not necessarily as pronounced here. Um, 
The sense of disgruntlement is not necessarily uh, always an underpinning here. This is typically about economic gain and benefit for, for the individual, for the ringleader. Um, and the difference between uh, an entitled employee and a ringleader is that, that this person doesn't have access to all the information they want. They want more than just the piece or pieces that they've created. They want an entire something. Um, a lot of times you're going to see this behavior when they're going to work at a competitor or when someone's trying to go into business for themselves, and they're aware that perhaps they're in Department A, and they, they believe strongly that the work product in Department A is critical to success, and they have access to that, so they're going to take it with them. But they also believe that the work product in Department B is critical to success. So they want to get that and bring that with them, too. They might want information on process. Uh, they might want templates that are used or, or different things of that nature. So they're going to they're gonna work on gathering that information. The two key words on this slide are recruitment and deception. Um, the ringleader doesn't have access to everything that he or she wants. So a lot of effort is going to go into recruiting others to help, and there's typically going to be deception involved about why that help is necessary. Um, now, this means there's more risk to the insider. There's a greater chance of getting caught because others are involved, and others may not have the same agenda as them. Um, so there's a lot of planning and a lot of groundwork laying that's being done. So as we think about the ringleader and we start to think about what are some things that we can do, some of the same things that we just discussed are going to hold true, and we don't need to go through those again. Um, you know, one thing I would, I would encourage everyone to do is just foster a shared sense of uh, security or shared interest in the security of a company amongst everyone. Make defense of a company's IP everyone's job. And that doesn't mean that we have to turn everyone into a snitch and everyone needs to be looking over everyone's shoulder. But if we <coughs> excuse me, educate um, people on the damage that can be done to an organization, um, should IP be taken, um, everyone will be kind of a little bit more sensitive to it and can help, um, can help in the process of looking out for things that don't make sense, especially when we're dealing with people that are leaving the organization and it's known that they're leaving the organization. You, know, you would want people's radar to be going off if someone that they don't typically get requests for information from um, is suddenly pinging them for a bunch of information and that person's on their way out of the company. That should obviously be a screaming, a screaming red flag for folks. Um, as we're reviewing that, the, the online activity um, of folks um, and looking for signs that they could be a ringleader, we're not just looking for signs of data exfiltration. Now we're also looking for, for the planning and the collusion and the recruiting. So some of the things that you could look for there, um, some up on the screen, um, shifts in communication patterns, uh, you know, new best friends. Um, that's the, the example where someone is all of a sudden um, sidling up to a person in another department because they need something they have. Um, there's not a whole lot of ways that people ask for things. Um, there are going to be some key phrases, can you get me? Uh, please send me. I need some help getting access to. Um, so as, as you're going back and reviewing activity, you can kind of keep an eye out for those types of uh, indicators as well, and that can help you with detection and then with mitigation against a ringleader. So that's a little bit on the ringleader. We're going to keep moving through today, and we're going to take a look at uh, what's probably the most well-known insider type, the disgruntled employee. And again, we have the, the definition of disgruntlement up there. At the end of the day, this is an angry or un upset or unhappy person. And it's a classic precursor to insider threat behaviors. Um, you know, you're going to see people that feel that they have been wronged or they perceive unfairness or unfair treatment or unequal treatment, um, and they use that to rationalize uh, actions to harm a company. Um, and to convince themselves that it's okay to do that. There, there's an element of revenge seeking here. Um, I, I say that it's probably the classic definition of an insider threat. It's probably the most well-known. But the questions are, is it the most well-prepared for? Is it well-defended against? Um, there's a lot of potential bad acts here. There's a lot of things that a disgruntled employee can do. This is a pretty easy-to-understand type of threat. So let's talk about some of the things that we can do to counter a disgruntled employee. Well, the good news is um, a disgruntled employee is a bit more predictable. 
There's more outward signs. Um, you can tell when people are unhappy. Right? It's usually not that, uh, not that hard to see. Um, but people uh, tend to become uh, disgruntled or disillusioned, dissatisfied, um, a lot of times tied to events. And there are specific events <clears throat> that can occur in an employee's life cycle that, that should be triggers uh, to those of us who are defending the company, the co company's IP and keeping it secure, that we need to keep a closer eye on the behaviors and activities of people within the organization. Um, I'll run through a couple of them. Uh, people can get a poor annual review or a smaller raise than they expected. Um, they can be put on performance plan. You see that a lot in sales. You see it through other areas of a company um, where, where the company is sitting down with someone and saying, hey, right now you're not doing the job we need you to do. These are the steps we need you to take. And if we're not able to take those steps with the help we're willing to give you, uh, then there could be some consequences. That's that has the potential to open up that 30-day window with some folks because they believe they're on their way out. Um, people that feel like others are getting preferential treatment. Um, you have people that uh, interview for internal promotions and don't get them, and they're upset about that. Um, people that believe their boss is on their case. A couple of other things that you see is when a coworker that someone was very close to is let go. Uh, that can be a trigger for anger or disgruntlement. And then certainly whenever there's uh, any kind of uncertainty or rumor circulating about potential reduction in force or an actual reduction in force, it's a very common uh, cause of employee uh, unhappiness that leads to insider threat. So I would encourage everyone here um, to have a plan for communicating with your HR department. If you think about a lot of the things that we just ran through, HR has information that can help you secure the company if you guys are communicating about it. Now, HR may not be able to walk over to you and say, hey, Debbie applied for an internal promotion. Yeah, she didn't get it. Sally got it. Um, so you've got to keep an eye on Debbie. But they cert could certainly communicate to you, we believe there's uh, elevated risk associated with Debbie and would like you to keep a closer eye on her activity um, until we let you know that we believe the risk is gone. Um, so have a plan for communicating with your HR folks. They have a lot of access to information that can help you understand where your potential threats lie. Um, we have a white paper on the subject it's called Risk Mitigation, Keeping Employee Risk from Becoming Insider Threat. Uh, it's available at whitepapers.securityweek.com if you want to go out and grab that. Um, there's some real good information in there, and I believe that still does not count as a product pitch because it's a free white paper. Um, so moving on, as we, as we work through the... The, the different types of malicious insider. Um, let's move up from the most classically understood one, and let's take a look at the mole. And this one is, you know, probably the best name we came up with. It sounds like we're getting into a spy movie. Uh, it's all very exciting now. Um, so the mole is someone who's inside your company working for the benefit of an outside entity. And uh, I want to call attention in the upper right-hand part of the screen there. I have a small screen grab. Um, of a document from <coughs> the folks at CERT. Uh, it deals with insider threat of intellectual property um, inside the U.S. for benefits of foreign governments or organizations. Uh, it's a great read. If anybody hasn't read it yet, I'd encourage you to go out and get it. Um, but that's, you know, an outside entity frequently can be outside of the country, and when that happens, it's, it's very frequently the country of origin of the person um, that is now on the inside of your company, but it's not always outside the company. Um, I've had a board member in my career who at one point had, had purchased a company that had some very unique intellectual property. It was effectively game-changing in the industry the company was in. Um, and a competitor, somebody that had been very successful but whose technology was in the process of being obsoleted by this new approach that, that my board member's company had, um, suddenly released an offering that looked a little too familiar. So litigation followed, and in discovery, uh, hard copies of, of this company's secret sauce, if you will, their design, their process, were at, hard copies of documents were actually found at the competitor's location. And as they dug into this, they were able to tie it back to a couple of employees who had joined the organization on behalf of the competitor. They worked for the competitor right before their time with the company and then went back to them right after. They were moles. They were there to take information for the economic benefit of that competing company. This stuff, unfortunately, does happen. 
Um, you see some different things here. A lot of times a mole is going to be somebody with specialized skills. Um, they're going to be people that are involved in the creation of but also have access to uh, that secret sauce. So you're going to be looking um, you know, at engineers, at coders, um, at scientists, depending on your interest, uh, depending on your industry. Um, in the Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie Mellon paper, one of the things they call out is that uh, when um, IP theft is being conducted on the bad of a foreign entity, 70% um, of the time scientists or engineers are involved, whereas within domestic cases where the, the entity is inside of the U.S., that gets down to only about 20%. So there's a real there's a real uh, shift there, and that can help guide you a little bit as you as you figure out how to deal with the mole. Um, so what can you do in terms of a mole? Well, many of the best practices we've discussed are going to apply here, um, and we don't need to go through those again. But one of one of the things I wanted to do is just encourage everyone to think about risk, and think about risk associated with positions. There are positions that have increased access or greater access to your IP because they need them to do their jobs. Positions like that and the people in them should have their activity monitored more closely. Um, they're, they're, they're in with your secret sauce, with your crown jewels, and that's the stuff that you need to protect. You know, the insider threat, as we talked about earlier, is dangerous because they have authorized access and because they know exactly where to go for what they're looking for. So really, you know, take a step back, think about your risk, and then align your security your internal security, including the monitor of employees' activity or, or uh, contractor activity, along with that risk. Um, you know, th this is a point where I, I typically say in conversations with people that we all want to trust our employees. We all need to trust our employees to enable work to get done. There has to be an element of trust, but relying on hope and trust as a security strategy is not a good one. Um, I always encourage people to trust but verify and to make sure that the access that you've given is being used for the purpose that you want it to be used. So that's a, a little bit on the mole. Um, we'll move forward to the last uh, type of, uh, last member of our rogues gallery that we're going to talk about, talk about today, um, and we've named him Hacktivist Harry. Uh, and this, this is a, a kind of an interesting one because this one gets a little bit different. Um, you know, the term hacktivist came into use, you know, back in the mid-90s, there's a lot of very well-known hacktivist groups out there um, that get a lot of publicity, um, and there's been a lot of, uh, or there've been some uh, insider cases recently that I think fit into this this category. If you if you look back to like a Manning case or a Snowden case, which everyone knows uh, very very well at this point, uh, these were people that were working for a cause, um, and that's the underpinning of the hacktivist is that they are, they are doing this for a reason. If you look at the definition down there in the kind of the lower right-hand corner, um, typically motivated by a political or a social purpose. Um, there can be others. Um, oftentimes, they're going to be targeting government organizations, as in the case of Manning or Snowden, but you can see examples of it in other, in other industries as well. You know, we'll talk a little bit about Morrison Supermarkets out of the U.K. Um, they had a theft of payroll data. Um, so data, including bank account details, was taken, and it was published online, and it was sent on some form of, uh, of media uh, to a newspaper. Um, and, and so when they investigated this and to try to figure out what happened, um, the, uh, they couldn't see any, anything that pointed to the work of an outsider, and there was no loss of customer data. And typically, you know, as we all know, customer data is what people go after, um, what, especially when they're coming in from the, the outside because there's a lot of value to it. But an extraordinary number of employees, it was about 100,000 were affected. Um, as the company reviewed its internal security systems, um, they really came to the conclusion that it appeared to be an act of revenge or the term they used was hacktivism. Um, and, and one of the things that led them to that is because it, it looked like only employee data was involved, only people that were inside the company. So, again, that high-value customer data was left out. But there was no gain. There was no economic gain. There was no other type of gain uh, to the person that did this. They published it online. They wanted to make it public. They wanted to embarrass the organization. So you can see these types of, of people driven by a cause um, inside of different organizations. Again, typically you'll see them a lot in government, but they exist in other places as well. So what can we do about a hacktivist? Um, 
again, many of the best practices that we've talked about um, and, and common sense things like making sure that data is encrypted um, are going to make sense here, things like logging access and looking for anomalous behavior. Um, but a couple other things that you can do is, is foster, foster a strong culture. Um, you know, if you've got everyone focused on a common mission and rowing in the same direction, um, it's going to become easier for someone that doesn't believe in that mission or is not necessarily rowing in that same direction to stand out. Um, so, you know, I would encourage people to really look at their culture, another area which, where HR can be helpful to you. Um, and then, you know, inside of a company, too, and this, this cuts across uh, many different things, um, you know, strive for transparency whenever possible. One of the things that, uh, that I've found is that when there is no transparency, people assume the worst. Um, and that, you know, when you start to get in other forms of, of unhappiness or whatever, it can help mask the behavior of a hacktivist. So that, folks, is a, is a quick walk through um, the insider rogues gallery uh, as, as we see it and the six different types of insider that are, or, or six different types of insider that are very prevalent and common within organizations. Um, I promised I wasn't going to do a lot of product pitching, and I'm not going to. But uh, some quick information about SpectreSoft and what we do. As I mentioned earlier, we make user activity monitoring software. What does that mean? It means we collect a lot of information about how people are interacting with the resources and the accesses they've been given. Um, we assemble that information. We package it up so that our, our customers um, can use it to understand the digital behavior of their employees and their contractors. You can see on the screen here um, kind of quick graphical representation of the breadth of information that we collect. And I want to point out here that um, you don't have to collect everything all the time for every person. If you need to, you can. <clears throat> but I always encourage folks to align their activity monitoring strategy to their goals. So if you're worried about insider threats, Maybe you're not so much worried about what website somebody's going to. That might be more of a productivity use case. You're not really concerned about their social media. Um, but you're certainly going to be worried about documents leaving your network, about network activity, um, large downloads coming down to someone, um, about files moving around. If you're dealing with highly privileged users, um, you know, you're going to want to go down to the level potentially of logging keystrokes because every keystroke could be very, very damaging. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility built into our in, in, into the capabilities of our products with the data we collect. Um, but all of this data is brought in and it's pulled into a, a central console. Now, we, we package it up in a couple of different ways. We have a classic security and event log monitoring solution that you can see on the right side of the screen. But then the, the ones that are in that user activity uh, family of products are, are broken into two different categories, passive monitoring and active monitoring. Our passive monitoring solution is called Spectre 360 Recon, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that one a little bit. Um, Spectre 360 has traditionally been the company's flagship product, is an active monitoring solution. That means you're collecting all that information that we just looked at, and it's being pulled back into a secure SQL backend on your prem, um, and the data is being made visible for review, um, for reporting, uh, you can spin alerts off of it, but people are in there and they're looking. So this is, this is commonly used for high-risk profile positions, um, certainly in cases of investigation as well, and for productivity monitoring. And then there's a more lightweight tool uh, for folks that have a, a temporary focused investigation that they need to conduct, or if, you're, if your hair is on fire and you think something may be occurring right now and you need to get eyes on it, Spectre c and Investigator is a great tool for that. But it's the Spectre 360 Recon product I wanted to talk uh, just a little bit about here today. Um, this is our newest offering. It, it came out towards the end of 2013. Um, we've seen great adoption on it. it. It comprehensively records and collects all that activity that we've talked about. What's interesting here about Recon is that it collects the information and it stores it for a 30-day period um, by design. Um, down where the activity occurred in an encrypted and obfuscated file, um, so it's there if you need it. Um, now, we can also spin alerts um, off of the data as we log it to help you understand if there are behaviors going on in your network that warrant a closer look, and we're going to be enhancing those alerts in the very near future with some, some very cool things that I, I'm excited to share with you the next time we have an opportunity to talk. 
<clears throat> but you know, we talked as we ran through these different types of insiders several times. Um, this concept of the departing employee and and this high risk inside, exit period and and where IP theft is, is taken or it occurs and where IP is taken and data is taken um, out the door uh, by insiders. So, you know, I would really ask that everyone take a look at Spectre 360 Recon as, as you think about implementing a policy for making sure you have the ability to review the activity of a departing employee. Um, a lot of the, the rationale behind Recon came from this. The product is built for this. Um, we store data for 30 days. It gives you the ability to look um, in that 30-day window before and after the notice of resignation. Um, it's a very cost-effective product. It can really help you be able to, as we talked earlier, to act quickly and to react quickly and to roll back the clock. So I promised I wasn't going to do a lot of product pitching. I certainly did some here at the end. Um, I appreciate you guys sticking through it. Uh, that was all of the information we wanted to cover today. Um, so I think we hopefully have time for a few questions. Um, for those of you who are going to be dropping off, I really appreciate your attendance. Um, hopefully this was informative for you. And uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience, Danielle. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, a few people did ask about that URL to the white paper. Could you repeat that for them? Sure. Um, I got to actually flip through my notes. It's certainly available no on our website, but it's available on uh, it's on the FT Magazine site. Um, it is at whitepapers.stmagazine.com, I believe. Uh, yeah, that should be one of the places that we have it. Um, okay. And if anybody else, you know, gets access to it, you can certainly send us an email and we'll get it out to you. Got it. Um, the first question we have is you talked about external threats that become insider threats and about malicious insiders, but what about the non-malicious insider? What can companies do to help with this type of threat? Ah, I was afraid someone was going to ask that question because I can't claim a lot of expertise here. Um, you know, there are some common sense things I think that, that people can do. Um, Certainly fostering that shared sense of security um, can help here. I think that there's a, there's a need for continuous security training and education inside a company. <coughs> and there are companies that do a great job at this. Uh, a lot of times they're larger organizations. Smaller companies struggle a little bit from a resource perspective. But a, a continual reinforcement of what is good behavior from a security perspective and what is potentially dangerous behavior can really help there for people that may just, they make a mistake. Um, I would also say that, you know, doing some, some sort of basic things, maybe run some phishing tests and, and see if your employees are, are, are responding to those types of things. That could be a precursor to somebody accessing credentials. Um, those types of things can help with a non-malicious insider. Um, so those would be a couple of quick ideas, Danielle. Got it. Um, the next question is, uh, well, someone said some of the information you collect seems pretty invasive. Um, how do people react to being monitored like this? Ah, so we get, we get this question in different forms a lot. So, um, and, and I'm glad it came up. So a couple of points on that. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about the configuration options that we have and how you can only record or log the activity um, that you need to help accomplish your goal. So let me flesh that out a little bit. I'll give you an example. Uh, a lot of people do their banking online today, right, probably the vast majority of people. Um, there's not a whole lot of reason why an organization is going to need to see what an employee is doing when they're on their online banking site. Um, so you can configure our solutions very simply to go blind when people go to their online banking sites. Um, so that would be one area where you can – you can start to become less invasive because you don't need access to that type of information. You know, as we talked about, you know, if you're not worried about productivity, then you don't need to record or report on things like social media usage um, because it's not core to the mission of what you're trying to accomplish or certainly what we've been talking about here today. Um, so we built a lot of options into the software to help companies accomplish their goals um, without being too invasive. Um, and that was actually one of the underlying reasons that the recon product we talked about um, was created. Um, we had a lot of IT security folks who understood the value of having that single pane of glass into employee activity, unable to convince others in the organization um, that to implement something like that unless there was a known cause or a reason to investigate or monitor someone's activity. So it was hindering investigations. Um, and in the case of uh, departing employees, like we've been talking about, it, it was causing um, 
IT folks to spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and sometimes a lot of expense using a different range of tools um, to try and, and make sure they pull together a complete picture of what happened and that nothing had left the network in that 30-day window. Um, last point on this, uh, really quickly, I always encourage organizations and organizations should always disclose um, that monitoring is happening. I bet you almost everyone on the phone here is already doing this, either in a login notice or an employee handbook that someone has to sign when they start. Um, you've already conveyed to them that the activity and the things that happen on the network are subject to review in some form or another. Um, you know, so you're, you're beginning to let people know and, and to treat your employees like adults. You can explain to people that there are real security threats that occur um, because of insider activity and the company's taking steps to protect itself and the employees in general from the damage that an insider incident can cause. Because there, can be, there can be serious economic consequences to an organization, and that can affect um, you know, employees that had nothing to do with it. So we've done a lot of surveying on this, um, and we've actually seen that very high numbers, surprisingly high numbers of employees, are not only okay with this type of monitoring, they assume it's being done anyway. Um, so kind of last point, I think I said last point already, I, I apologize, but we've got another white paper uh, that one of the leading attorneys in the country um, as far as, as monitoring employee privacy and the issues that go around it put together for us. It's available on our site, um, or you can send us an email and uh, over at sales at spectrosoft.com. Ask for or look for the 10 tips for preparing an effective acceptable use policy. Um, great resource. Uh, Littler Mendelson is the name of the firm that, that put that together for us, and that can really help guide you through some of the issues that I think are behind a question like that. Right. Um, the next question is, will you guys be at any trade shows if we want to get a demo? Ah, oh, that's a cool question. Um, well, we will be. Uh, we're going to be at InfoSec World in Orlando at the end of March. It's the last week of March. Um, and we're also going to be at the RSA show in April in San Francisco, which I think is in the, the 24th, somewhere in there. Um, so we'll be at those, <coughs> excuse me, couple of shows uh, in the near time. We'd love to see you at our booth and would be happy to schedule some time with you too if you want to do something a little bit more in depth. And of course, if you didn't want to wait for, uh, for a demo, we can certainly uh, set one up for you remotely via the web. Uh, we're not shy about that, so uh, we'd be happy to do that as well. Got it. Um, more questions are rolling in. One of these is a two-part question. Um, it should all companies perform e-discovery for PII data on servers and endpoint devices. Uh, they ask specifically in the healthcare industry, uh, and they want to know because they wondered if that was too much time-consuming effort um, and spending of resources on DLP and looking for anomalies. Wow. Um, that was there's a lot in that question, question. <laughs> and it is a yeah. good question. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I would say, um, you know, certainly um, PII and, and PHI is, is information that needs to be protected. Um, you know, pattern matching and regex expressions can certainly help you identify if that data is in places or being accessed and um, where it should not be. Um, you know, DLP certainly has a role to play there as well. Um, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've observed as an outsider to the DLP space is that a lot of times uh, the P in DLP is not being implemented. Um, that uh, whether it's because of false positives or because uh, too often the, the business, the non-security focused folks inside a company um, exert pressure on security to roll back controls uh, in the name of productivity, that a lot of times that the preventative aspects of DLP are not being used and it, it really becomes more DLD. Um, you know, I, I think the, the need to protect that information is paramount, um, you know, across whether it's customer data or, or employee data, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it, it can get expensive. It can get cumbersome. You know, certainly in some industries there's going to be regulations that require you to do certain things. Um, but I think that that's something that, that, uh, that companies should certainly invest um, time and resources into making sure they're taking appropriate steps on. Um, and that's a, that's a question that we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll get that in the record and we can have a more substantive offline conversation about uh, if necessary. Great. Uh, the second part of that is still an extension kind of on how much resources, companies, and time should they be spending. Um, but they ask, should companies perform more pen tests internally and not just wait for a quarterly third party for compliance? 
Uh, well, that's a good question, and you know, I, I may not be answering this in the exact way that the the, the uh, person asking the question was looking for, but you know, compliance and security for me are two very different things. Um, and you can satisfy compliance requirements and not be overly secure. Um, so I, I don't know if a regularly scheduled uh, pen test um, is, uh, is, is necessarily always going to be good enough. Um, I, I'm always a believer in trying to do things at unexpected times, uh, whether it's related to security or, or just in general, because it shakes up status quo a little bit and has the ability to catch um, to catch things off guard, if you will. So I, I kind of separate the two in my mind, and there are certainly requirements that have to be met um, to satisfy compliance mandates and regula regulations. But I think to be truly secure, we need to go pretty well beyond what those requirements are. Okay. Hopefully that and, just, and I just have a quick question about the product. Is it deployed on the host or endpoint or on the network? Um, yeah, so... The style of monitoring that we do is an endpoint-based uh, monitoring. You know, we believe that when you're dealing with user activity, you want to be as close to uh, the user as possible. It helps to filter out some noise, and it gives you visibility into some things that might be harder to detect at a network level, let's say. So you know, in conjunction with different things that companies may be doing, things like looking at traffic like we talked about earlier, um, we believe having – uh, an agent down on an endpoint where the activity is occurring is going to let you capture a more robust and a more accurate picture um, of the of the user activity. So that's the style that we use. So it's a kind of classic uh, client server type deployment. Okay, got it. Um, we are going to close up the session now, but I just want to say thanks again, Mike, for your uh, presentation. Very insightful. Uh, thank you again to our listeners today. Uh, I want to let you know that this webcast will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SC Magazine website or the next business day, and please join us next time. Yeah, thanks, everyone.